good to be here. I uh, appreciate Brother Jordan. Jordan asking me to come back every year. It's always a blessing to be here, and I enjoy doing it. There's nowhere I'd rather be than right here at this particular moment, actually. Uh, if you're the speaking at the end of the meetings, then it's pretty much true. There's only a finite number of verses, you know, <laughs> in the Bible. And if you narrow it down to Paul's epistles, there's even fewer. So, I mean, your verses are pretty much talked about once, twice, three times, four times, you know, even more. But that's okay. I don't mind that. And as a matter of fact, I think it's kind of a good thing in a way because uh, Russ said something that made me think about something that actually was a great benefit to, to what I'm going to share this morning, I thought. And uh, it's just what he said it, the way he said it, it just kind of clicked something in my mind. And I'll share that in, in a moment. I want to say hi to Rodney. <laughs> he said he was going to be watching on the Internet, so I'm assuming that he is. So hi, Rodney. And say hi to Sam, who's not here, but we had this conversation with Sam earlier, and I just want to say hi to him, too. Uh, say, uh, uh, I, I'm thinking about you, okay? Uh, this morning, or this in the morning sessions, we've been talking about Paul's salvation words, and it's probably normal then that glorification would be the last message, right? Uh, that's something that hasn't exactly happened yet to the fullest extent of it. But let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word, and we come humbly uh, asking that uh, your spirit would minister in our inner man and that you would edify us uh, to be more like Christ in every way. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, so we're talking about glorification. That's my uh, topic this morning. Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 30. Romans chapter 8, verse 30. And uh, he says here, Romans chapter 8, verse 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. See the word glorified there is in the past tense, right? So I trusted Christ as my Savior in 1971, and when I did that, there was a lot of things that happened to me, and they happened to you too. I didn't know about those things at that moment in time. Over the course of the years, I've grown in my understanding about these things and, and have a better, more complete knowledge of them. And I, I was declared righteous. That's what it means to be justified, right? I didn't know that that night, but God did that. But what God also did when I did that is he glorified me. It's in past tense. It's a sure thing. And I think that from God's perspective, from God's point of view, it's already a done deal. It's not something that's iffy or chancy or maybe mil or will or maybe it won't, but it will. It has happened from God's point of view. Every person that's trusted Christ as their Savior has been declared righteous, and they've been glorified also. And this is the thing that I thought that came to me as Russ was talking because he said that Satan looked at when God made men, he looked at those earthlings. I like that he said that. He looked at those earthlings and he thought, I don't have to worry about them because they don't look like anything. And we really don't, do we? But it dawned on me that our glorification is an essential part of God's plan to recapture and to take back the government of the universe, right? That if we weren't, because he's taking these people like us, like me and you, and he's going to put them in these positions, and glorification is, is a part of that. It can't be done without that. So it is our hope, right? It is our confident expectation. We're not, it's not an iffy thing. It's not maybe it will happen or maybe it won't happen. It is going to happen, just as sure as you're sitting here this morning. And from God's point of view, it already has happened. So it's our hope, it's our confident expectation of a future benefit that is a certainty to come to pass. But for us on an experiential level, it hasn't happened yet, has it? I'll tell you it hasn't happened, you know. Uh, you know it hasn't happened. The thing about our glorification is, well, we have this wonderful position in Christ, right? We're seated in the heavenlies in Christ, and we talk about our standing in Christ, 
And it's a very important thing to understand that and to let that have an impact and an influence in our lives, right? This standing we have in Christ, and we talk about our state. And, and you know that your state doesn't always match your standing. You know that's true. And glorification is when your state then is merged into your standing, right? And then the totality of it and the beauty of it and the wonder of it, you will have an experiential thing. I I said a moment ago that when I trusted Christ, you know, you have all these things happen to you. There's a whole package deal, but you don't really experience it, do you? And and you come to the scriptures, Paul's epistles especially, certainly, and, and... How many people don't even know about these things? That's really a shame. But you come to the scriptures, you see these things, you operate on the basis of faith, you believe them, you act upon them, and then they begin to have an influence and an impact on your life. So we talk about glorification, and there's a future aspect to it, obviously, but there's also a a present aspect to it, which we'll talk about this morning as well. So our future is glorious, is it not? Wow, you think about this, uh, you know, I look at our country, and I'm afraid for our country. I don't think the future of our country looks too glorious right now. And I'm so happy that my hope isn't based upon uh, elections and politics and talk shows and all these things, that my hope is based upon something that Christ has done for me and my faith resting in that work for me. That's, I'm happy for that. Now turn to Colossians chapter 3. And we'll see here, there's something here about our glorification. And it, it's my, after studying this out a little bit, that uh, our glorification is an aspect or a part of the life that we have in Christ. And he says here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ. Now, we've had a lot of talking about the word if, haven't we? (laughs) And he says here, if ye be risen with Christ, there's no doubt about the fact that that's a true statement, that we're risen with Christ. That was one of those things that when I trusted Christ as my Savior, that it happened to me, it happened to you. I was identified with Christ and everything that Christ accomplished what Christ accomplished became what I had done because of my position, this position I have in Christ where God identified me with Christ and made me a member of the body of Christ. So if we then be risen with Christ, that should have an impact in your life, shouldn't it? He says, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, you don't have to turn there, but most of you know, Ephesians 1, 3, that we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, right? That's what you have there in heaven, and that's what you should be seeking. And he says something else here. We'll get to it in a second. I kind of want to go to it now, but I want to finish verse 1. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. So Christ is at the right hand of God. You're seated there with Christ, with the Lord Jesus Christ, in heaven at the right hand of God. None of you have ever experienced that yet. You're waiting for the day when that will be a physical reality. But he says, because it's true, he says, set your affections on things above. That's not what's down here on the earth, is it? (laughs) Isn't it true that what's the closest to you sometimes gets the most attention from you? You know, it's true, right? And so that seems like you you say that, you make that statement, seek those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. That seems like a pretty remote thing. But the fact of it is, is that in some ways, of course, it is. But in other ways, it's not. You are connected with Christ. Set your affections on things above. The things that ought to drive you, that ought to motivate you in life, that ought to compel you and get your attention are those things that are above. Because what do we learn in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4? Paul says, the things that are seen are what? Temporal, right? But the things which are not seen 
are eternal. The things that you can't see that you learn about in the Word of God based upon the fact that you've trusted Christ as your Savior and you've gotten this package deal of benefits. They could put it like that, couldn't you? You get a new job, you get a handbook, and it tells you all your benefits. Well, you kind of got that here, don't you? <laughs> so start focusing on those things. Stop focusing on these things so much. I know you got to go to work, you got to have money, you got to pay your bills, you got to put gas in the car, you got to do all those things. I know that. Uh, but yet, put your perspective, put your affection, set your affection on those things that are above. And these things that are down here, you just got to deal with, basically. <laughs> you got to deal with it, but that's all part of being prepared for that day in the future. So set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. If ye, be de if ye are dead, for ye are dead... And your life is hid with God in Christ. You have the life of Christ in you, right? You know that based upon the scriptures. He says, ye are dead, and your life is hid with God in Christ. Can you imagine a more secure place for your life to be than to be, to, than to be hid with Christ in God? It's like Fort Knox, only better. So I got to thinking, and I guess it depends who you ask about this thing, isn't there really gold in Fort Knox? <laughs> and I looked on the Internet this morning. Is there really gold in Fort Knox? And, you know, I know it's the government, and so it might or may not be true, but they say there's gold there. But you know what? They're not going to let you in there to find out. <laughs> You're taking that how? By faith. <laughs> You're believing something somebody says. Now, I'm assuming there is. I'm trusting there is. I don't know, does it really mean anything to me personally if there's not? I suppose it might. <laughs> but my life is here with Christ and God. That's a more secure place. You know, Fort Knox, it has a, the door on the vault is, of Fort Knox weighs 22 tons, and it is impervious to drills and all kinds of any, anything, even bombs couldn't get that door open. And the roof of Fort Knox is bomb-proof. But your life is hid in God, hid in Christ with God in heaven. That's a more secure thing than whatever there is in Fort Knox. Amen. And it's just gold anyway, you know. <laughs> What's to say we learned about... We learned about the things that are seen are what? Temporal. So all that gold there is one day not going to be worth anything. It's going to be gone. Our very life is hid with Christ in God. I don't know. That sounds like a wonderful thing to me. Galatians 2.20, that's a, that's a verse we all know. <laughs> he says... I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. I'm not the same person I was before I trusted Christ as my Savior. I'm not the same person. I have a life now that I didn't have before. I had physical life, but I didn't have spiritual life. And now I have that. I'm crucified with Christ. That's Romans 6, isn't it? That's, that's uh, Colossians chapter 2. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ died for me. He died for my sins. He died for your sins. You can take and you can make that personal that Christ died for you to pay for your sins <coughs> to pay for my sins I mean, you can't look at a person physically if I put a we they took a picture of us over there yesterday but if 
and all those people were saved people. But I mean, if you lined up, if you lined up a bunch of people up here, and you just looked at them, could you tell Christ was living in them? No, you couldn't, could you? Now, if you know them a little bit, maybe you could kind of tell it. But if you don't know them, you don't really have a way of knowing. There's not a sign on your forehead that says Christian or something like that. And there's no halo over your head. <coughs> it's not there. I see, I could see all of you, and I don't see any. So turn back to Colossians 4. So we have this life of Christ in us, and it's something, or Colossians, yeah, Colossians 3, sorry. So he says in Colossians 3, 3, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now here's why I say that your glorification is a part of the life of Christ that you have in us, because when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. So when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, and he's not appearing now or yet. Some people say he appears, has appeared at different places, different times. Uh, just ignore that kind of talk. <laughs> Don't get caught up in that kind of a thing. Because when Christ, who is our life, will appear, then we will appear with him in glory. We will be glorified at that time. So our glorification is a part of the life of Christ that is in us. Now, the, the, the verse that we're going to go to is probably an obvious verse, Philippians chapter 3. verse 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our, conversation, for our conversation is in heaven from whence we also look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's kind of saying what he was saying in Colossians 3, uh, the same idea, the same concept about Christ our life, and our life is hid with God, Christ in God. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence we also look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the verse. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. See, we're waiting for that, aren't we? The day will come when our vile body will be fashioned like unto his glorious body. That would be a great day. Amen. There's a lady in our church. She has cerebral palsy. She's had it, obviously, her whole life. She's 74 or so in that range, between 70 and 74. And she's dealt with that her whole life. And I look forward to the day when mm -hmm. I see her, and that's not an issue anymore. Amen. You talk about a person that has a good attitude about life she is the most wonderful person you would ever meet and and you know some people get bitter and mean because they have these physical infirmities i don't have a problem like that i say she's a better person than me <laughs> i would and i guess it's partly because of that and she's learned to deal with that in a godly way and it's really a blessing to me to see that kind of a thing so Christ will change our vile bodies to be fashioned like unto his glorious body. The word change means to transform. Fashion means having the same form as another, so it will be changed into that form. And glorious means uh, splendor, brightness, magnificence, excellence. There's a couple verses, three verses here I want to look at that, that might kind of I'm sharing with you something I kind of believe, but I wouldn't ask you necessarily to believe what I'm going to share with you about this. But look at 1 Corinthians 15, 50. And I, I think I'm right about this. <coughs> we talk about being changed. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, For now I, I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth Corruption inherit incorruption. So flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 
And, and Morris brought out the vo- uh, verse in Levit- Leviticus 17, the life is in the blood, right? What does your blood do? What's, what, is the, what is it doing in you? It's, you? You breathe in the air, right? And in the air there's oxygen, and the blood is flowing through your lungs, and the oxygen gets transferred into your blood, and it carries, the blood then carries that oxygen all through your body, right? What happens if it gets blocked somehow? Let's say, you know, you have a blockage in your leg and the, you don't take care of that or what can't be taken care of. What happens to your leg? It dies, right? Because you, you need, they used to mock the Bible for saying the life is of the flesh is in the blood, but they found out it's really true, right? But what happens if you lose your blood? There's an ar- artery on the inside of your thigh here you could get a wound there, and it might not seem like a real serious thing, but you know what? It is a very serious thing, right? You know, what happens if all your blood comes out? You're going to die because the life is in the blood. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's my contention that, look at Luke chapter twenty-four, thirty-nine. It's my contention that It's just interesting how this is, Luke twenty four, thirty nine. <clears throat> Luke twenty four thirty nine. This is after Christ's resurrection. He's meeting with his uh, disciples. He says, "Behold, my hands and my feet; that it is I myself. Handle me, and see." For a spirit hath not flesh and, blo- uh, flesh and bones, as ye see me him. You notice he doesn't say flesh and blood. He says flesh and bones. That's interesting to me. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. He says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. What doesn't it mention? That's my contention that the resurrected body of Jesus Christ didn't have blood. Now, I don't understand how that works or is, but that seems to be what it's saying. And that means that when you, your body is changed and glorified to be like Christ's glorious body, it will not have blood in it. That's my contention. You know... If you were an astronaut and you got launched into outer space and uh, you went outside of your space capsule, what would you need to go outside of that? Oxygen? Okay. How do they give you that oxygen when you're outside of the space capsule? There's a suit, right? And if you went out of there and you didn't have a suit, you would die, right? You know, my dad used to tell me this. I think it's true. You know, if you lower... You lower the pressure, you lower the boiling point, and you know space is pretty much a vacuum, so that your blood would boil, actually, and I guess you'd probably blow up, but (laughs) it it probably would be over pretty quick, I guess. (laughs) So he says, who will change our vile body to be fashioned like unto his glorious body. The vile body is the body you're in. I don't know about the room you have here, but in our room, there's a mirror, and you flip that light by the mirror, and man, isn't that like bright? <laughs> and I was, had that light on, and I was sitting looking at something, and I got up and looked in the mirror, and I had these glasses on, and I was foolish enough to look at myself through the, they magnify, right? They're just reading glasses, <laughs> and I, I go, Whoa! <laughs> Have you ever seen one of those little <laughs> concave mirrors that magnify? You ever seen one of those? Don't ever look at yourself. <laughs> it's not a pleasant experience. <laughs> That's the vile body you're in. It's going to be transformed Amen. to be like his glorious body. Amen. He evidently could go from heaven and back to earth in a moment short amount of time you know that satellite they sent to pluto which just passed pluto this week i don't know if you saw any of those pictures of pluto very amazing 
They launched that thing nine years ago. <laughs> That's a long time, because that thing is, Pluto is maybe billions of miles away. I don't know. You won't have a problem like that, evidently. Our vile body shall be fashioned like unto his glorious body. That's going to be a great day. Amen. I look forward to it. You know, you know, come soon, Lord Jesus, right? <laughs> so that future glorification is because of the life of Christ in you. But there's also a present aspect of that glorification that should have an impact on us. And I want you to look at uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, <coughs> verse 14. John chapter 1, 14. I'll get there. It says here, And the Word was made flesh, that's obviously Christ, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Now, how did they behold his glory? The Word became flesh, and they beheld his glory. Now, obviously there was the time, <coughs> Matthew 17, where there was a transfiguration, and obviously there were incidents where he would do miracles, and those would be manifestations of his glory too. But my contention is you that at there, that was only a one-time thing, the transfiguration, and I suppose miracles were a more uh, often event than that, but they probably still weren't like going on every day continuously, I suppose. But there was a way that his glory was manifested and I want you to turn now to Exodus chapter 34. Remember Moses wanted to see the glory of God. And God allowed him to see the backside, the fleeting, a fleeting glimpse as God moved away from him. But it's interesting, Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> well, start at verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in, ki in ki goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. And he talks about the more justice part of it, forgiving, or in, at the, toward the end of the verse, forgiving iniquity, transgressions, and that, will by, that by no means will clear the guilty visiting iniquity. So what, what the glory of God is, is it seems from that verse that God in the purity of who he is without any taint of sin or flaw or anything, he, he is those traits, those qualities. He has in himself uh, mercy and gracious, grace, long-suffering, abundant in goodness, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Those are qualities of God that are a part of his glory, and it is so pure in God that he is this blazing ball of light, as it were, that, that the goodness of him is so good and so pure that, that that is the quality of it. And when Moses saw that, he was hidden in the cleft of the rock, right? And God allowed him to see the glimpse of that as he was passing by, and then there's the, also the aspects of his justice and holiness and whatnot. But all of that is a part of who God is. Aren't you glad God is loving? Aren't you glad God has grace and mercy? Aren't you glad for that? Amen. Well, what I'm saying is that when it says they beheld his glory, yeah, sure they saw those other things, but what they saw every day in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ was an example of what that looked like, the goodness and the mercy and all that. That was an example they saw every day of what that looked like in a person, in a human being. <clears throat> and they saw that, and they were like, oh. you know why they did that? That's <laughs> right, exactly, because they weren't like that at all. Peter says, how many times should I forgive, Lord? Seven? And he probably thinks he's being 
kind and merciful and gracious, you know? Seven times, Lord? You know, if someone offends you once, twice, aren't you keeping track? Three, <laughs> four, five, six, uh-oh, here's seven. Wham! <laughs> what does Christ say? Seventy times seven. Even that's a limit. And that's not exactly grace the way we understand it, you know, because there's a verse that says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That's more than 490 times. Grace is this magnificent thing that we plunge into the realm of and live in. And then, oh, that's such a bummer. We have to extend that to other people then, isn't it? (laughs) Everything there was about God was manifested in that man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You ever notice how many movies that are made are about revenge? You ever notice that? You know, you did me wrong, you did my family wrong, you did my parents wrong or whatever, my brother or sister, I'm going to get you. And the whole movie's built on that premise. And then, I, you know, I, it's really kind of disgusting and discouraging, actually, to see stuff like that. And then at the end of the movie, then you're supposed to feel, yeah. <laughs> and I suppose there is a certain sense of satisfaction in seeing that kind of a thing, but it's really not that healthy for a person, I don't think. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he says in verse 18, I'll we'll start at verse 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, but we all with an open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. He's talking about the Bible. You see in the Bible God. You learn from the Bible what God has done for you. You learn in the Bible and Paul's epistles that, that God has taken you and placed you in Christ and given you the life of Christ. You, you, learn, you learn all that in the Bible, right? And, and you come to the scriptures, and you ever notice that when you come to the scriptures to read them, they read you too? You ever notice that? It's like, oh, wow. It just like zips you right in the heart. I shouldn't be the way I am all the time. And I say that based on, you know, what I find in the Word of God. So, I, and it's an interesting thing that as I come to the Scriptures and I see God manifesting himself in the Scriptures, and then I have indwelling me the Holy Spirit of God who sealed me till the day of redemption, that there's something that happens there as, as the, the Bible that was given by the Holy Spirit, and it ministers in to the Holy Spirit who dwells within me in my inner man, something's going on there. And there's change taking place. And you know, it's always for the better. (laughs) It's always for the better. So we're changed into the image. I mean, we positionally are made into the image of God when we trust Christ as our Savior the image of God that was in Adam that got messed up as sin entered the picture is renewed, recreated in us, and and we're created in Christ, given the life of Christ uh, because of that. But then he's going on uh, into chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. So he says, we see in the mirror, we see in the word this image, and and it changes us. And he says in verse 2, of uh, chapter 4, having renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, not handling the word of God deceitfully, but, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, <clears throat> it is hid to them that are lost. Lost people need the gospel. They have a hard time seeing it sometimes, don't they? When you got saved, 
and you went to your family and you began to tell them what happened to you, how you trusted Christ and, you know, that difference that made in your life to your family said, oh, praise the Lord, I'm so happy you came and told me that, right? Is that what they said? <laughs> they probably said, oh, you're a nut, get out of here, right? <laughs> well, you know, maybe one or two of them did say, praise the Lord, but usually that's not the response. And and it's because they're sucked up into that world system and they've got all these other things they think are more important. He says, so if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So they're blinded by the world system and by their old sin natures, and there's all kinds of things they think are more important than what they consider to be just religion. It's not religion, right? You all know that. Uh, you know, being a pastor, people think you're favorable about, favorable about religion. You know, that seems to be what people usually think. I mean, you tell them you don't like religion, and they're like, what? You ever go to the hospital, and they ask you when you check in at the emergency room, what religion are you? You ever had that? So sometimes it depends on the mood I'm in, you know, how bad I feel. But <laughs> I'll say, none. <laughs> And then they'll say, and what's your job and on there? I'm, I'm pastor. They look, what? That doesn't compute to them, you know? They're blinded. They're blinded lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but we preach Jesus Christ, Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servant for Jesus' sake. For God hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined where? In your hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of God, of the glory of God. We're talking about glorification, aren't we? Now, there's my contention about the Lord Jesus Christ. That was so perfected in him that if you, I I guess if you saw him across the room and you didn't know who he was, maybe you wouldn't know. But when you got in touch with him, that there was no way that this was not manifested in him. But see, this is what God is working to manifest in us. This is what God is trying to do to us. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure. The treasure is the glory of God, the life of Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's the earthen vessel? You know what the difference between a Harley Davidson is and a Hoover vacuum cleaner? (laughs) There's only one dirt bag in a Hoover. (laughs) I live in Wisconsin. They make them there. You know, I'm a dirt bag too, so (laughs) don't be offended. God took some dirt. And he formed a man. And he breathed into that man's nostrils the breath of life. And that man became a living soul. Now, sin entered into the picture, obviously. But see, what God wants to do in you is he wants to glorify himself in you. That life of Christ that you have in you, he wants that to be something in you. He wants you and me, to be walking, talking, living examples of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gives us his life and the Holy Spirit who indwells us. We have this treasure. Can you imagine a greater treasure than the life of Christ and the glory of God? We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
Wow. See, when I trusted Christ, I didn't really know I signed up for all this. <laughs> but, you know, looking back, you know, I don't regret it. Amen. It's a much better deal than whatever would have happened any other way in my life. And turn now to Philippians chapter 1. Verse 19, Philippians 1, 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing else I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness as always so now also Christ should be magnified in my body whether it be by life or by death. Can you really, can you say that about yourself that you hope Christ, that this is you have the life of Christ and the glory of God, and that this should be, this should, I, I forgot to mention, and I should have mentioned it when we were in 2 Corinthians 4, but he does go on in that verse, in that chapter, in verses 10 and 11, and talk about the life of Christ being made manifest in your moral flesh, doesn't he? So he says here, this is a very similar thought, uh, that so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether by life or by death. Christ should be magnified in you. you. You should be living your life in such a way, not to put you on a guilt trip or anything, but because I know, I know you're all doing it. I'm probably the only one not. <laughs> I, I couldn't honestly tell you that Christ is magnified in my flesh every moment of every day. I, I couldn't tell you that's true. I couldn't probably even tell you it's true half the time. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I'm short-tempered and irritable and aggravated. Like coming down here on Sunday after church, we were just so aggravated with everything going on, the traffic and, you know, man, I was just not in a very good mood when I got here Sunday. I'm in a much better mood now. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad. <laughs> My wife appreciates it too. <laughs> Christ should be magnified in your body. That should be our prayer, that Christ be magnified in your body. What would that look like? Now think about this for a minute. If Christ were being magnified in your flesh, what would that look like? I'm thinking it would look like something like this. Love, joy, joy peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Are you familiar with that list? When you have those things being manifested, <clears throat> the life of Christ is being made manifested. Now, sometimes unsaved people are nice too. You have to tell people why you are the way you are. You're not just a nice guy, nice person. But, I mean... Christians should be the nicest people on the planet, shouldn't they? So he says, still in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live as Christ and to die is what? Gain. Can an unbeliever say that? No. Every minute you have here on planet Earth, you have the opportunity to manifest the life of Christ and the glory of Christ. To live is Christ. The pastor we had years ago, that was his life verse. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To be alive on planet Earth while your blood is pumping, while your heart is pumping blood and your lungs are delivering that oxygen to all of your body, you have the opportunity and the ability to magnify Christ and to let Christ live in your body. That is why you are here. And a part of that would be evangelism too. But that is why you are here, to manifest the life of Christ, to be walking, talking, living examples of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1.
starting at verse 7. And you who are at trouble, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels <coughs> in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That's not about judgment, right? But then it says in verse 10, it's still a future thing. God's not judging the world today, is he? He's, he's pouring out grace. You know, people say they complain about this thing going on over there or that thing going on over there, and they say, why doesn't, if there's a God, why doesn't he do something about that? And, okay, well, all right. Well, if he's going to come and, he's gonna, if he's gonna come and take care of that thing over there, and you want him to take care of that thing, you know he's going to come and take care of this thing too, that you might not be so happy with. <laughs> But it will be that will happen someday. Don't ever say, God, why don't you take care of that thing, you know, because that's, that's kind of being disrespectful to God. When he, when he shall, this, this, verse 10 now, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and admired in all them that believe, that is you and me. That is an awesome, over, almost overwhelming thought that and this is a future thing still when it's you know undiminished and not messed up by our old sin nature that God will be glorified in us and I really like when he says admired God will be admired in all them that believe God people will look at you and me and they will admire God because God was able to pull it off God could take a bunch of people like us and he could do this and he could glorify himself in it and then he could glorify us so that we are walking, talking visions of who he is, of his glory. <coughs> now, turn back to Colossians. I'll read the whole passage again, Colossians chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, that hasn't happened yet. When he shall appear, there will be a day when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. There will be a generation of believers who are physically alive to see that event happen. I've known many people now. I've been in the ministry 25 years at, up at the same place. There's a man I met 25 years ago, and, you know, I, I met him, and I never, I don't know why I didn't think about it, I never thought I would do his funeral. But you know, last November I did. And it was it was an awful thing. He was only like in his mid-70s. He wasn't even that old. But to see the diminishing of his physical body. And I would go visit him at the nursing home and he would say, well, you know, Steve, you know what really bothers me is I can't remember the Bible verses anymore. It's a shame. So I would go and I would read him, you know, Amen. passages from Paul's epistles mostly. Amen. And then his body stopped working. They call it dying, right? Yeah. And he's with Christ in glory now. I envy him, actually. But... It's not death that's such a scary thing, really, for believers. It's the process of it, right? And it might come suddenly, quickly, but on the other hand, it might not. But either way, I, I, if I had a choice, I would rather go in the Lord. You know, I'd rather go that way, right? But we don't really have any control over that. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, 
then shall we appear with him in glory. Then it will be evident who we are and what we are and what God has made us in Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these wonderful truths. We thank you for that wonderful future, but we thank you even more than that, actually, that that can have an impact in us now as we are alive physically on planet Earth, and we pray that it would be so. And we just pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.